Hello, thank you for having me. And I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Let's see, okay, so um, as you saw from the video, I work right around the corner, about a mile away at the Massimo Life Center. I'm fairly new, I'll be coming up uh, just uh, pretty soon on my year two anniversary. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do over there. Uh, but our mission, in, as you saw a little bit in the video, is to rehab and release sick and injured uh, sea turtles and seals. We also uh, work in conservation and education, teaching the public, as we heard from Marianne. We don't just want this to be something that they come and they hear about for a minute. We need to, we need to affect change. So we have to teach them in a way that they think about it when they leave. And then last, we have, we have a research um, uh, arm of our institution. And there's a little picture there of a tiny lab, and that's our parasite lab. And it's a one of a kind in the country. So to give you an example, all of the parasite samples that were collected from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico came right here. So um, it's very effective. It's small, but it's effective. So we just heard about my background. I'm not going to belabor this, um, but I am going to say I'll focus more on sea turtles today than seals. Seals are important. Uh, we learn a lot about disease, diseases in the ocean, diseases that can go from seals to cetaceans things like that. So they are important, but today I'm going to talk about uh, endangered sea turtles and a crisis that we have happening right here on Cape Cod. Um, I will mention that um, when I came to, to do a walkthrough at the National Marine Life Center and I saw the hospital, as you can see in the photo, I found so much undeveloped real estate inside the hospital. And this is going to be key to helping us solve the crisis here on Cape Cod with endangered turtles. If we can build that out, we can be more effective in uh, supporting these animals until they're healthy enough to fly out to other, other um, institutions. So we're gonna start here just briefly. There's four species that visit Cape Cod seasonally, and the largest there in the bottom right hand, that's a leatherback. We won't be spending much time on that animal. They do not cold stun, but they are here in, in the summer season. They follow the jellies in. So when you start seeing on the news or if you're down at the harbor and you see jellies everywhere, uh, the leatherback turtles are not far behind. Um, they have a better, uh, I guess, adaptation against cold weather than the other species you see in the slide. Um, and the one on the top right there, that's the Kemp's Ridley, the most endangered sea turtle in the world. And that makes up 89 to 90% of the turtles that strand right here on Cape Cod. So the populations are, are they were decimated, collecting eggs, eating eggs, selling eggs, um, some of our fishery practices. So this is a species in peril. Uh, in the top left is a green sea turtle. They don't come here in the same numbers, but they do come here. And then in the bottom left is a loggerhead turtle. These are larger animals, so when, when they strand in more mass, they're a lot harder for us because they take up more room in our tanks. We did have one year in 2012 where we had 100 live loggerheads uh, at one point, and it was very difficult to house them stabilize them in time enough to start moving them out to other facilities. So I'm going to be talking today about why it's a crisis here on Cape Cod. And um, I'll give you a little bit of history about how they come here. So these juvenile turtles will enter the Gulf Stream. Often in the Gulf of Mexico, they could enter the Gulf Stream off of anywhere off of Florida. It goes from the Gulf of Mexico down and around the tip of Florida and all the way up the eastern seaboard. The Gulf of Mexico is really warm and nutrient rich. So this is a great environment for these little turtles to grow out um, and get bigger and bigger. As they do that, they're sort of exceeding different levels of predators. So the bigger they get, um, the greater the chance of survival. Um, during the fall here, you probably, if you live here, you hear all over the news that the turtles are starting to strand. Um, it gets really a lot of attention every fall and it, um, it's great because it educates the public and I keep waiting for the news to get bored and not cover it, but thankfully they do because it is a big story. So cold stunning is hypothermia, um, but for these turtles, it isn't just a cold snap and then you, know, you warm them up and you make them better. As the temperatures in Cape Cod Bay start to decrease with the onset of September, these turtles are already getting cold. So in September, they're starting already to become compromised. And now they're moving into October. Now they've been a month under this thermal stress. 
At some point, they get so cold that they aren't able to paddle, they can't dive, they can't forage, so now they're not eating. They lose their muscle, their ability to use their muscles, so they can't paddle. Now they're subject to the wind and the waves, and often they get blown onto shore. And that's where the Wellfleet Audubon um, group comes in. So it's um, Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary, part of Mass Audubon. Their role is to go around the beaches and pick up all these turtles, and then they transport them up to either the New England Aquarium or us where we stabilize them. So we have the beach team, the ambulances, and then the hospitals. And all of these parties are working together. So uh, warning, there's graphic, some graphic images in this talk. But when the turtles come in again, they've been out there usually for months under this thermal stress. So they're debilitated. Some of them uh, just can't even move. Oftentimes you can't tell if they're alive or dead because they're so immobile. They're depressed. Um, they're just sort of almost soggy, if you will, when you pick them up, everything just limp. Um, so first the word of business is telling who's alive and who's dead. We just assume they're all alive and you start the process of slow warming. They also come in with injuries. So you can see the center top photo there, that's an eye injury. Oftentimes, unfortunately, the gulls will start working on these animals before, you know, while they're still alive, the beach teams are racing around trying to keep them all up. They also, in that last top uh, photo there, you can see the, the front of its face, all that tissue, the little layer of tissue there that's gone. These turtles are getting bashed around out in the open against pilings, um, certainly, um, rocky outcroppings, anything like that. And as the waves move around, they're getting banged around. So you do see a lot of fractures. And you see on the, the photo in the bottom left, this is what they look like. They can't swim when they come in. We have to hold them and stimulate them to get them to start to breathe and move in the water. And once they do that, they start to elevate their heart rate normally. Um, versus us trying to, to use some sort of a cardiac stimulant. You can't do that now with hundreds of turtles. How many times a day would you have to do it? It's just not possible. So we use their own biology against them. We put them in water and they sort of have an instinct to try to lift their head and breathe and to try to paddle. Now they're getting a heart rate, which it's common for us to get a heart rate of three, four. If you get a heart rate of 10, this is a good turtle. Move them into the good pile and focus on the ones that are worse. Their core body temperatures are down sometimes at 40. We've seen temperatures at 32. Those turtles don't generally make it, and we probably shouldn't be trying to save a turtle that's core temperature is 32. We don't know what that does to their brain. So we'll focus on the ones that are a little bit more stable. Um, and we also see fractures. So this bottom picture on the right, this is a through and through. The top shell is called a carapace. There was a strike there. And you can see how open it is. Seawater is sloshing in and out there into the Salona cavity, introducing debris and sand, things like that. So now you have a, a high pro a probability of infection. Um, so good news is this animal healed fine and went on to be released. But it does take a while. It takes a lot of effort. And picture these animals coming in when hundreds of endangered species are coming in. And this all happens in maybe an eight-week period in the fall. So it's very intensive. It's not like hundreds of turtles are coming in over the year. That would be a lot easier. This is all happening in the fall. And it's often clustered around onshore winds and the tides. So this is just, I'll let you read those, but when they come in, they need a physical exam, almost like if you went to an emergency room for some, I'm not really sure what's going on, but I need some help. You would get a lot of these diagnostics. Um, Probably not the eye stain, unless you're there for a pencil in the eye or some other foreign body, you probably won't get that. But that's really important for the turtles because again, sand is in there and it's scraping the cornea and an eye infection is really bad, that's big trouble. So these are the type of things that need to happen for these animals. And again, we're talking about hundreds coming in at a time. So I'm sorry, this is a graphic photo, but um, you'll see the black there on the top. This is a radiograph or an X-ray. And air should come up black on a radiograph. Sea turtles have two lungs, but here you only see one. You only see one because the other one is completely diseased. It's full of um, either a fungal pneumonia or a bacteria pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia. So imagine trying to breathe. You're cold, 
you can't really even get air into that left lung uh, and the right one. I mean, you see this uh, sort of smattering of white in there as well. This should be dark with nice, crisp margins. This is a very sick animal. On the bottom right, so this is, a, this is um, lung tissue after one of the animals didn't make it. We always do a necropsy because we need to learn. Why did it die? Can we prevent it? What can we do better next time? And that white that you see is fungal pneumonia. And that's why the animal really can't get good air uh, into the lung is it's obstructed with this pneumonia. So we did a lot of studies at the New England Aquarium and a lot of these terms, especially the small ones, come in with pneumonia, probably over 90%. So the, the standard protocol now is treat them all. All the Kemp's Ridleys, when they come in, they start getting treatment for pneumonia because if they don't have it on day one, if they don't look like that, they probably are getting it. So, so they're all treated. So this is where the sort of crisis comes in. You can see in this graph here, this I took right off the... Um, Wealthy Audubon website. They have a great website, great information on there. So if you're interested and you want to know more about this whole process, um, you can go right to the website. It's at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so this is this is a chart, and you can see down there in the early 1990s, um, there was a young Connie Rigo who was so excited to work for the New England Aquarium. And the turtles started coming in, and I thought, oh, I'll just name them after the seven dwarfs, and this year I'll do the reindeer. Uh, and then all of a sudden we had a couple of blips. You can see in 19, 1995, we had a blip. And then we started seeing more blips. And now you can see towards the end here, it goes up to 2022. This is a real problem. We've had at least one year, 2014, we were completely overwhelmed with 1,200 turtles. So many of those were alive and they were coming to us. But look at the blue part. Those are the endangered Kemp's Ridley. So the populations right now, it's hard to study these animals. It's hard to do population assessments for the Kemp's Ridley because they spend most of their life at sea. So when they come out to nest, there are nesting teams that do some modeling. So the best we can do is count the nesting females and then model what we think the male population might look like. And I'm going to talk about the problem with that in a few minutes as well. So the problem on Cape is getting bigger. And there is a published paper out there by the Wellfleet Audubon group and some colleagues. They did a study on what's happening here and what are the predictions for the future. And their predictions for starting uh, in, I think it's 2031, they are predicting over 2,000 turtle stranding per season. So 2,300 plus is the actual prediction. They published that paper in 2019, and you can see, for the most part, they're right. So you do see a few years there. In 2019, you can see when they were publishing that paper, it was a lower year. When you see that, because these are juveniles, it usually means we have to go back and look at what happened on the nesting beaches two years ago, three years ago. That's important because it's all a ripple effect. Was there a big mortality? Was there a hurricane during nesting season? You know, what happened a few years after Deepwater Horizon? So it's all connected. We're hearing that theme today. So this is what it looks like when it really happens. So this is a room down at Wellfleet Audubon. Majority of these turtles are Kemp's Ridleys in there. I picked out, I think, two greens and one loggerhead. The rest are Kemp's, and that's pretty much a representative of what happens. This is one tide worth of animals. So when we really start seeing them come in, it's usually after three days of sustained winds on shore, and then this is what happens. And then what happens is we are overrun with the ambulances. These are all volunteer drivers, and all of these turtles come up to both of the rehab centers at once, and it's, it's overwhelming. So why is this happening? Well, a change in climate is a good culprit. We like to think that possibly some of the uh, conservation on the nesting beaches is also helping. And that's true, the Kemp's Ridley was almost decimated again because of poaching, uh, fishing practices, things like that. So there's been a lot of changes, but now we're battling the climate. And what does it mean when we have a warmer climate? For us here, it's increased stranding events. Um, for all the reasons you see here, we've heard of this, this theme. Animals need to move around. If it's too warm for them, they've got to go. Maybe it's too warm for the food they eat. 
Now they have to go find, they've got to go wherever that food is. So again, for us, it's increased stranding events, which is sort of the common theme here. So the photo on the left I took from the um, Gulf of Maine Research Institute, great website for climate information, especially here, you know, for the Gulf of Maine. Um, Cape Cod is that sort of lower part of the Gulf of Maine. And this is what we called a uh, marine heat wave. Who knew there was such a thing? But that's now a term because when you have these rapidly warming um, temperatures in the ocean, especially in distinct areas like the Gulf of Maine, there's distinct changes. So uh, the Gulf of Maine is warming three to four times uh, faster than any other body of water on the planet. There's about three that are warming around this, but I think ours is, tends to be the worst. And that's gonna have serious impacts on the turtles. So one thing to look at is, oh, it's hard for me to see what you can see, I'm trying to point out Cape Cod without falling off the stage. <laughs> and I think I'll stay up here. <laughs> um, but we've got a, uh, here we go, thank you. Yes, perfect. So before a lot of this warming expedited, what was there, thank you, um, we believe was a cold water gate. And now what we're seeing is a warm water bridge. So turtles that would exit the Gulf of Maine might come out to the coastal environment, feed, and then as the days get shorter, it starts getting colder, they would head down the coast um, to warmer water. Some of them would go back out to the Gulf Stream, which we didn't know until we started satellite tagging uh, some of these turtles. These are just two uh, tags from turtles that we, we tagged years ago. We were trying to understand, does all this work? We're between the aquarium, um, National Marine Life Center, some of these other places, we're investing a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of money into trying to save these turtles, but we didn't know if it worked. You know, we can stand on the beach and like, woo, high five, and maybe they go out and they starve to death over the next three months. So we studied whether or not they survived, and a lot of this data shows that they do. Um, we are going to be publishing a, a paper on this pretty soon, it's almost done. Just have to push it over the, the uh, goal line, but the survivorship rates are very good for these turtles, even ones that you saw with a fracture like that. If they get the attention, if we follow the protocols, then um, they have a very good chance of survival. So when I was talking to Katie, um, she was very depressed by the time I was done with the sea turtle thing. And so, <laughs> so she said, you know, where's the hope? Is there any hope? So I've been focused on what's happening here on Cape Cod Bay in the escalating numbers of strandings, but the reality is the populations of turtles are in peril as well, a whole, not just our Thames Ridleys here. As the planet warms, the, we are making more female turtles. So these are reptiles, their gender, their sex is determined by the temperature of the nest and the planet is warming. So we are, and we have been at least for the past 10 years when all of the researchers started to really communicate. This is a huge network, by the way. There's an international sea turtle symposium we meet every year. There's over 80 countries. And this is what we talk about is how do we, how do we help? How do we solve this problem? But there is hope. So, I mean, this is a quick Google search. Um, I just grabbed some papers, but uh, one of the efforts happening now to try to save the species is they're collecting the eggs and they're incubating them at the temperatures we need to be able to create nests. So this will work for a while, but what happens in 50 years? Well, hopefully this effort buys us enough time so that the animals start to adapt. Maybe they're gonna start nesting in other areas. Maybe they're gonna come farther north. And there may be a hint that that's happening. In the past few years, we've actually had two turtles come out, one successfully nested in New York that's unheard of, that's so far north. And we had what's called a false crawl in New York. So that was an adult green, green turtle came out when they do their sort of nesting preparation, but then they don't actually nest, that's called a false crawl. Mm -hmm. So two turtles have come this far north. Maybe that's part of how they're going to survive. So if we can help mitigate you know, the mortality in the meantime, maybe they have a chance. So sorry if this was depressing, but there is hope. <laughs> There's hope, Katie, don't worry. So thank you for um, your attention today. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank the hosts. This is a great conference, getting a lot of great people in the room to think through some of these issues.
Thank you.